Hi everyone, and welcome to this masterclass on how we tell our stories. Um, my name is Pippa, and I'm very happy to be joined today by writer and filmmaker Juliet Jakes. Um, this masterclass is part of School Diversity Week, which is an initiative by the charity Just Like Us. Uh, School Diversity Week is a way of bringing diversity into the classroom uh, to learn about the lives of people around us and to celebrate diversity across the country. Um, this year, our masterclasses are all online, which means that wherever you are, you will have the opportunity to view the content and access the content. Um, and in order to make sure that that can all happen safely, we're going to be posting a link in the comments um, with all of the information that you need to stay safe online. Um, in this masterclass, we will be hearing from Juliet Jakes, who will be talking about storytelling from an LGBT plus perspective. And then it's over to our amazing Just Like Us ambassadors for a Q&A session. Um, so let's hear from our guest. Juliet is an author, filmmaker and journalist whose work often centers on trans experiences. And among Juliet's work is her book called Trans, a memoir, uh, the short film You Will Be Free and the forthcoming, sto uh, forthcoming short story collection Variations. Um, so welcome, Juliet. Hi, thanks Pippa for, uh, for a lovely introduction there. So yes, my name is Juliet Jakes and as has been said, I'm a writer and filmmaker. I also make radio programs and I also teach art and creative writing. So my practice is quite varied. I write fiction, short fiction, uh, I've written a memoir. I also write a lot of journalism and essays and I cover a wide range of subjects. So literature and film, art and music, gender and sexuality, politics and history, uh, and even football sometimes. Uh, so, so a real range of things. But I want to talk about writing fiction or well, any narrative really. I think what I'm going to talk about today is also applicable to memoir and other forms of, of storytelling. But I really want to talk about building narratives and how to how to build narratives, how to tell stories, and how and why they can be useful for the LGBT plus community. Growing up, I didn't really have a lot of stories. I didn't know any openly gay or lesbian or bi or trans people or queer or intersex people. And there wasn't really much talked about in school. In fact, there was still a law against uh, talking, talking about these things in schools at the time, which has since been uh, overturned. But there wasn't much access to storytelling. There was also nothing in my local library, uh, in the fiction section or in the non-fiction section. So really it was very hard to, to find stories, uh, except on television, uh, where I sometimes saw films dealing with trans or non-binary subjects. And that really led me to think a lot about, as a teenager, led me to think a lot about the importance of, of telling stories and how in seeing characters and plot lines uh, involving LGBT people, and in my case, trans people, um, you can really see yourself in the world and imagine a future for yourself and maybe even think about how to make the world better for yourself and for other people. Um, so I knew I was trans from quite an early age and really wanted to find stories about it, but also find ways of telling my own stories about it. And that was one of the things that got me into making creative work, into writing and uh, drawing, uh, and eventually making films as, as well. Um, so I really want to talk about the, the techniques I've learned over the years. I've been writing for more than 20 years now, and I want to share with you in this masterclass some of the techniques that I've learned and the way in which I build a story. And lots of my stories are about trans and non-binary people, whether that's myself or others. Um, the book I'm just about to publish, the short stories are all about the history of, of trans and non-binary people in Britain. Um, so these techniques are used for all of those stories, as well as for my memoir, when of course I was telling, telling my own story. But the way I always start with a story is to identify something, to notice something, maybe a story I think that's not been told or hasn't been told properly or hasn't been told by the people who I think should be telling it. And that's particularly true of trans and non-binary people because so many people write about us uh, and historically it's been far more people writing about us than us being allowed to write about ourselves. And of course a lot of my, my work has been devoted to 
writing about myself and about my community and creating space for other people to do that. So noticing that something is missing. So for example, with this volume of short stories, noticing that there just weren't many trans writers being allowed to publish fiction full stop. Uh, there weren't, there wasn't um, a history of trans people in Britain that had been told in a book, uh, a comprehensive history. Um, so that was for that project. But I'm going to talk about a short story, in fact, a very short story that I wrote recently um, for the Canary Wharf Foundation called A Quiet Afternoon, um, which you can find via the Canary Wharf Foundation's um, short story takeover initiative. Um, but I was asked to write a very short story for them to celebrate pride and to celebrate some part of the LGBT community. And so that got me thinking, OK, which parts of the LGBT community do I not see celebrated very often? And, and maybe I'd like to hear, hear more of their stories and maybe even write that story. And I thought, well, actually, older transsexual women these days, you don't really hear their voices so much. There's a lot of focus on um, on younger people. But when I was growing up, most of the trans people I met were older transsexual women. And I sort of felt like their stories weren't being told that much. I don't really know why. Maybe it's prejudice against older people. Uh, maybe they just wanted a quieter life. They don't want to be so vocal. Uh, so I thought, OK, let's let's use this this brief this idea of celebrating a part of the community for pride to to create a character who is an older transsexual woman and use the story to explore just what her life might be like uh, in work in family and in this LGBT community so so I always start with with this this sort of field this area that I want to explore and then the next thing to do is to create a central character and that central character, of course, is going to drive the story. And it's important to think about lots of details of that central character, who they are, where they grew up, um, who their family were, where they went to school, um, what they are interested in, what they like, uh, maybe their love life, what they do for work, all of these things. Um, and you can find character questionnaires online uh, that will help you to build a character and give you lots of questions that you can ask to say, who is this person? But the most important thing for driving a story is always, what is this character's goal? What do they want from the situation? What do they want from life? And what are they prepared to do in order to get it? And that is something that will drive any human drama. You think of something like Romeo and Juliet, the, the two characters, they, they love each other, they want to be together. What are they prepared to do in order to get it? Um, but you can apply this to any story, I think, any any human story um, is this pursuit of these goals. So you have the, the thing that you want to explore and you have a central character and you work out what their goals are. So in my case, I created a central character who was in her mid fifties um, called Claire. And yes, so she's a transsexual woman. And really what she wants is to find a, a kind of a community that will understand her, will help her to understand herself, maybe help her um, with fitting in at work and with um, her family who aren't really very understanding about her transition. Um, so that's that's her goal. And then from there, so you have the area, the character and their goal from there. There is a very simple way that you can create a story with five simple elements. So first off, you have the opening where the character is in their normal world, um, but something isn't right, something they want to change. So then the second element of the story is the inciting incident. So something happens that makes them pursue their goal, sets them off on this, this hero's journey, if you will. Um, and then there's a set of risks that the character takes um, in pursuit of this goal. And basically they up the stakes every time for, for dramatic purposes. The, the risks they take maybe get bigger and bigger uh, until they reach a climax, a final confrontation with whatever is stopping them achieving that goal. And the thing that's stopping them could be something personal, something in themselves. Um, it could be another person or persons. Um, it could be something 
in society more widely, but something, whatever this is stopping them from achieving their goals, they have this final face off against it. And then the story ends with a conclusion. Did they achieve their goals? If so, yes. If they did, yes, they did. Does it make them happy um, or not? Does it significantly change their life or not? Uh, if they don't achieve their goal, what are the consequences? What What is the the tragedy, really? If they don't achieve their goal, is it a tragedy? What does it mean? So those are your five crucial parts of a story, the opening, the inciting incident, the risks, the climax, and the conclusion. Uh, and so you can really apply them to this story. I'm going to read the story now. It's called A Quiet Afternoon. It's about five minutes long. Dad, said Lucy. Please don't call me that, replied Claire. I'm sorry, but you are still my father, said Lucy. You need to find someone whose job it is to support you. I don't mean to sound harsh, but I've got my own life. And so's mum. Lucy put down the phone. And I went back to my desk and looked up the LGBT support group HR told me about. The nearest branch was Brighton, 20 miles away. Sorry, I've just realised I, I made a mistake. I've switched from third person to first person, so um, I'll just start again. Dad, said Lucy. Please don't call me that, I replied. I'm sorry, but you are still my father, said Lucy. You need to find someone whose job it is to support you. I don't mean to sound harsh, but I've got my own life, and so's mum. Lucy put down the phone, and I went back to my desk and looked up the LGBT support group that HR told me about. The nearest branch was Brighton, 20 miles away. They said if I was going to come, I should visit the local drop-in centre for trans people. I did, and for the first time, I met people like me. Thirty years younger or more, but like me all the same. Brighton Trans Pride is next weekend, said Zach, a young trans man. Come? An old biddy like me, I replied. We'll look after you, added Steph, a trans woman in her thirties. I got off the train from Three Bridges and walked to Brunswick Square. There were stalls giving out food and pamphlets, a stage for bands and speakers, and people painting each other's faces. Soon I found my new friend having a picnic in the sun. You dressed up, said Zach. Some random kids told me I looked like their gran. Ignore them, said Steph. You look great. Claire, this is Anna. I think you'll get on. Anna smiled. Is this your first trans pride, she asked. I nodded. You'll enjoy it, she told me. It's chilled and run by the community. She showed me the programme. Martial arts workshops, because we need self-defence but also activists talking about how we could make a better world. I'm a lover, not a fighter, I joked as we went around the square. Anna asked if I loved anyone at the moment. No, my wife ended things when I came out, I said. We barely speak now. I still talk to my daughters, but it's hard. Anna held my hand, and I knew she'd been through the same. I brought some drinks, Anna said as we sat down, and plastic cups. I told her about how I'd kept my engineering job, but my colleagues didn't talk to me unless they had to, and old friends had stopped getting in touch. She hugged me and said, you're not alone. We sat quietly as the speakers talked about how incredible it was to see so many trans and non-binary people showing our strength, but how much more had to be done before we could even speak of equality, and the day flew by. I've got to go for dinner, said Anna. You're not coming to the gig, I replied. I'm a bit old for that, she laughed. Who are you meeting, I asked. Just a friend, she told me, and gave me a card. Here's my number. Keep in touch. Anna kissed me on the cheek and left. I didn't know whether we'd become friends, or maybe more, I told Zach and Steph. But even if I hadn't found a partner, 
I knew I'd found my people. So the story I wrote, A Quiet Afternoon, it has all of these elements of the story. So my central character, this transsexual woman, Claire, in the opening, you see her in her normal world. She's at work, she's on the phone to her daughter, and you're told that she's daughter by her calling Claire dad and father. So she's clearly struggling to think of Claire as, as a woman and not really accepting her transition and then telling her quite bluntly that she needs to find someone else to support her and not rely on on family. So you can see that something's very wrong, that she's not really being supported properly. Um, so that's the opening and the inciting incident comes next when she goes to her desk and thinks, OK, it's time to find out what we have at work, what human resources have to support me. And the first risk she takes is going to visit this LGBT support group in Brighton. So um, getting the train down there and, and taking a risk with getting involved with the community for the first time. And then the next risk she takes is talking to these younger people. She thinks they might not accept her but she makes the risk of talking to them and they invite her to Pride. So she's being given away into, into the community. And the next risk she takes, of course, is actually going and getting the train and risking um, people uh, being uh, mean to her, the kids in the street just telling her that they look like their gran. Um, and the risk she takes is carrying on, not going home. And indeed, her friends tell her to ignore them. So she carries on. And then the next, next risk she takes is meeting Anna and deciding to spend her day with Anna as another uh, trans woman of a similar age. Thinks, OK, here's somebody who could become a part of my life and, and help me with my goal of, of getting more into this community. So she takes the risk of spending the rest of the afternoon mostly with Anna and walking around the stalls and listening to the speeches. The climax comes when she basically says to Anna, look, I want to be friends somehow. And she invites Anna to this gig and Anna says, I can't come, but gives her her phone number. So that's the climax is they've become friends. They're going to keep in touch somehow. And the conclusion is that Anna leaves and Claire just goes back to her friends. And She's not sure whether she is romantically interested in Anna. Maybe she is. Maybe they could love each other. But she concludes that doesn't really matter. The fact that they're friends and will get to know each other and probably be important to each other is enough for her. So it's a happy ending, really. She achieves she achieves her goal. She she finds her way into into the community. So that's the the conclusion is 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 that she she has this way into this world that she didn't have before, and her life is probably going to change for the better. So that's the narrative of A Quiet Afternoon. And like I said, I think you can apply this opening, inciting incident, risks, climax and conclusion structure to pretty much any story. Uh, famously, the shortest story ever written is by uh, Ernest Hemingway. And it's six words long and it goes for sale, baby shoes never used. So you have the opening, there's two people who want a baby um, or one of the partners gets pregnant and the inciting incident indeed is that the one of them gets pregnant and this is you know this is all kind of implied by these six words it's not all spelled out but the inciting incident is the pregnancy they take one risk that we're told about which is to buy a pair of shoes before the baby is born uh, the climax is that for whatever reason the couple don't keep the baby or the baby isn't born or it's given up for adoption um and the conclusion um is that they are getting rid of these these baby shoes so everything is implied in those six words so i think you can apply this structure to anything and i think you can apply it to stories about your own life i used it when i was writing my memoir um for the overall story and for all the stories within the book um but i think it's a very simple and a very good technique that will help you to tell your stories. Um, so yeah, maybe that's a good time to, um, to go to questions. 
That's brilliant, Julia. Thank you so much. Um, I can already imagine people watching this and like taking down some notes of what's going to be their first uh, their first novel. Um, so yeah, we'll go to questions from the ambassadors at the moment, and I think our first question comes from Steve. Uh, hi, 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 Julia. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I think we've all learned something about story writing. But what I'd like to ask you is, what got you interested in writing in the first place? Yeah, that's that's a really nice question, and actually uh, one that I've hardly ever been asked, surprisingly, in my 20 years of, of writing. Um, I mean, I read a lot as a child. Uh, I read a lot of Roald Dahl and Dick King Smith and uh, the Mr. Men books and all sorts of things. I was always reading. Uh, so I think maybe deep down, I always knew that I wanted to to write and that the written word was something I really valued and really loved and really wanted to use as a way of communicating with people. And I mean, I also really liked talking to people as a child, people my age and older. And so I always wanted to find a way to communicate with people directly. And I think writing is, you know, it can be the most direct form of communication. Uh, obviously with writing, you can use lots of metaphor and things as well, but but really it's it's designed to communicate very directly with people. Um, and as I got older, I read a lot more and I discovered literature and drama and poetry and all these these different ways of turning writing into, into an art form. And that really appealed to me too, this idea that writing didn't just have to be very simple communication, although it can be, it can also be um, a way of turning the world into something sort of beautiful and funny and interesting and moving uh and i i just think writing i thought writing was incredibly versatile you can do almost anything with the written word uh, and that always really really excited me so it was something i really wanted to to try and and as i got into my teenage years i, I tried writing plays and television programs and short stories and just gradually found the right ways for me to write that that short fiction and memoir and journalism were the were the things I really really enjoyed writing and the things I was best at. So yeah, that was that was my way in. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Steve. Um, and our next question comes from Ash. Hello. So my question is that you've written fiction like novels and stories, as well as non-fiction like journalism. So do you prefer writing either fiction or non-fiction? Hi, hi, Ash. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, it kind of depends. I mean, I think I think fiction is my favourite thing to do. I think I just talked in the previous answer about, you know, the way you can turn words and writing into art. And I think fiction is my favourite way to do that. I mean, I tried writing poetry and before and just found I wasn't really a poet. It wasn't the right form for me. Uh, I've tried writing plays and indeed we'll probably go back to that. Um, but with fiction, I really like the challenge of creating believable characters, creating a believable world and creating believable stories. Um, I think it's always really interesting. And the way that you can use fiction, once you're sort of saying, OK, this whole thing is a big lie, I'm making this up. You can actually be very truthful about the world you live in. and talk about things that maybe haven't happened to you but have happened to other people that you can sort of imagine how that felt so I really like those challenges I mean non-fiction obviously comes in many different forms and some types of non-fiction writing I like more than others I mean I do a lot of short journalism so pieces that are maybe somewhere between 500 and a thousand words so one or two pages um, and that can be quite a nice thing to do um, but that's really what I, I do for work. That's that's what I do to make a living. That's how I use my writing to support myself. Um, and I much prefer writing longer pieces where I can really get under the skin of a subject, perhaps do more research and meet people and travel. Um, but every form of writing has its advantages. Every form of writing provides some ways of thinking about the world we live in and finding out more about the world and its history and its people, uh, maybe opportunities to travel, um, to go somewhere new mentally or physically. Um, so every form of writing has, has its advantages, I think. And anyone watching this who thinks, I don't know whether I want to be a poet or a journalist or a screenwriter, 
firstly, I would say, you know, you can do all of these things. You, you don't have to be restricted to one form of writing. There are always skills that move from one type of writing to another. Um, and secondly, just experiment, just find the forms of writing that you enjoy the most and pursue those. And it's never one of the nice things about writing is it's never too late to start. You know, there are people in their 90s publishing their first novels. Um, so it's never too late to take up a particular type of writing. Um, and that's one of the things I really like. And, you know, I'm sure I will continue to write fiction and different types of nonfiction for the rest of my life. You know. Thank you, Julia. That was a lovely answer. Thank you, Ash, for the question. And yeah, thank you, Julia. That was such an inspiring answer as well. Um, I think our next question comes from Lily. Hiya. Hi. Uh, so you've written a book about your own life. So my question is, what was it like uh, writing about your own experiences? Uh, yeah, thanks, Lily. That's that's a really interesting question, too. Um, and it's, it's one I do often get asked, actually. Um, you know, memoir is is a strange and difficult thing. And a lot of people who write memoirs or write about their own lives do it because they want to maybe try and sort of change the world, not just for themselves, but for people like them and to make people understand what certain experiences are like and to create a space around which people can discuss that issue. So in my case, I wrote about my transition and being trans because I wanted people to talk more about trans living and non-binary living and to listen to our voices uh, rather than the voices of people who have no experience of of, of trans living. Um, I mean, obviously, one of the big issues with writing about your own life is it, it's very exposing. You know, you, you give away a lot about your own life and you can never get it back. Once once something is out in the open, it's, it's out. Uh, so you have to think very carefully about that. And I was constantly having to make decisions. You know, how much do I want to tell an audience about my mental state, my love life, where I live, what I do for work? All of these things, you know, how much am I prepared to give away and what are the risks, um, you know, in terms of how family and friends react to something, how a wider audience reacts to something. There's always things you can't predict, of course, but, you know, you can you can anticipate some of the issues there, I think. Um, so it was constantly making decisions. And again, this story structure that I shared earlier actually helped me a lot once I thought about what the narrative I was telling in terms of what my goals were, in this case, to transition and to write about it. Uh, and then what the story structure that would tell that story, well, you know, my opening, my inciting incident, my risks, my climax, my conclusion. Uh, once I thought about those, it made it easy to decide, OK, which things fit into that story and which things don't. Uh, so that made it a lot easier to decide what to keep in and what to leave out. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a real, real vulnerability to doing, to doing that work um, that was often quite exhausting, quite difficult, led to people, people I knew and people I didn't reacting to me in ways that I couldn't always predict. Uh, but I'm really glad I did it, you know, I mean, people still write to me all the time and say your book really helped me or I gave it to someone I love and it really helped them. Um, and really, you know, that you can't put a price on that. That makes absolutely everything worth it. So, yeah, awesome. I think that's... Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. <laughs> um, and for our next question, we're going to go back to Steve. Hi again. So what writers or pieces of writing have inspired you in your life? Ah, that's uh, that's a really big question. Thank you. And I mean, I, I read incredibly widely and I'm also inspired and influenced a lot by film and music and visual art. Uh, so I could give you a very, very long list. Uh, I've been starting from a very young age. Um, you know, I mentioned Roald Dahl earlier and I really liked the sort of rebellious spirit in Roald Dahl's writing. Um, you know, the kind of worlds they created were very strange and very funny and quite dark at times, but also quite silly. Uh, so I think that was he, was, he was really the first writer who really, really made me kind of want to write myself and think, okay, I want to create my own world here. I mean, as I was growing up, uh, I discovered Oscar Wilde as a teenager and, you know, Oscar Wilde was one of the first LGBT writers I wrote. His life story, of course, is 
very interesting in many ways. It's very sad because he got sent to prison for his sexuality and, and he didn't live much longer after that. Um, but Oscar Wilde's writing, of course, was kind of light and funny, but also serious and sensitive and very, um, very observant about how people lived. Uh, when I went to university, one of my favourite writers became the French gay writer Jean Cocteau. Uh, and I really liked his novels and plays uh, and films and drawings. And what I liked about Cocteau was, was he sort of said to me, look, you don't just have to be one thing. You can make many different types of art. Um, and what unites them is you as the the creator, the things that you're interested in, the things that you're concerned with. Um, will always shine through in whatever you make, even if you're working in what seem like very different fields. Um, I mean, there there are so many and there are probably too many to list here. I mean, I read George Orwell a lot as a teenager and, you know, I thought the way Orwell just engaged directly with the big politics of his time, um, including living it, you know, including going to fight in the Spanish Civil War. He wasn't just writing, he was actually kind of getting out there as well and, and doing something uh, physical. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and there was also a group of trans writers that I discovered um, as a student. So people like Kate Bornstein, Leslie Feinberg, Sandy Stone, they were all writing in the 1990s when I was a teenager. And they were all saying, look, you know, to trans people, look, it's really important that you write about your experiences. Your experiences are valid. They're interesting. Writing about them can be, you know, artistically fulfilling, but also socially and politically useful. Uh, so those writers were a great inspiration to me. And I guess the, the final the final group of writers I would name would be a lot of African writers from the 20th century, people like Chinua Achebe and Sembe Nuzmane and Ngugi Wationgo, who were writing after um, the European countries left and African countries were becoming independent. And they were writing about that process of independence, but they were really trying to create a literature, a bit like what I was saying earlier, with uh, LGBT and, and trans writers not having any writing, and so writing in order to create a culture. Uh, and these, these African writers were doing the same thing, and I always found that project really interesting and really inspiring. So yeah, that's, that's just a small, uh, a small selection of, I would say, the kind of hundreds of writers and filmmakers and artists who have, have really inspired me over the years and really made me want to create things myself. Thank you thank for you. the question, Steve, and um, thank you for providing such a great reading and viewing this, uh, Juliet. Um, I think our next question is going to be from Ash. Hi again. What would you say to a young person who wanted to become a writer? Yeah, that's that's a really nice question. Again, there's an awful lot I could say. Um, write about not just what you know, but what you want to know. One of the nice things about writing is it's a way of exploring a subject and getting to know a subject. So write about the things that you want to know about. Um, always try and enjoy it. Always try and find types of writing that you enjoy doing and focus on those. Um, because if you don't enjoy a piece of writing, no one else will. Um, so, you know, try try different styles, try poetry and try uh, short stories, maybe, and try longer things. Try different things and see what suits you the best. Um, don't give up. Uh, you, the best piece of writing advice I ever had was just from a friend at work. Uh, when I was working in a job I really didn't like and lots of my writing had been rejected. I was about 25 years old. Nothing was going very well. And my friend said to me, look, you become a loser when you give up. So, so don't give up, never give up. Like I said earlier, you were never too old to become a writer. That's one of the greatest things about, um, about this is, is you are never too old to start or to, to be published. Uh, and, you know, just enjoy writing and don't worry too much about whether you are a writer in terms of being paid to write. Um, you know, if you are writing, you're a writer. Uh, and it's really important to keep that in mind as well. And, you know, actually thinking about the economics of it is important as well, because very, very few people, even quite famous writers, uh, make a living just from writing. Uh, most writers who you'll see um, in the papers or publishing books will also be teachers or they will also have some other type of work. Um, so, you know, don't define 
what's worthwhile writing just purely through through money and payment because you know the arts are so much more than that um so yeah i think those would be uh just a handful of of the advice that i would give to to young young writers uh, but the most important one is just keep at it don't give up thanks julia i think that's some great advice I think our last question is going to be from Lily. Hi, yeah, me again. Hello. Uh, so just one last question. Uh, so what other things are you interested in outside of writing? That's a nice question, Lily. Thank you. Um, and I mean, I have to say that um, part of the problem with, with doing journalism is pretty much anything that you are very interested in. Uh, will become part of your writing uh, and it's very important to keep things as as hobbies um, so I mean I love music but I don't really write about music very much um, partly because a lot of the music I like is quite old now and I think it's just boring to to tell younger people that you know older music was better I think that's really tiresome I don't want to be the person doing that uh, but also just to have something that is just a kind of hobby and doesn't get tied up with um with with writing uh i mean i play football a lot i mean i write about football but i also play a lot uh so i play for an lgbt team in london um and i've been playing in lgbt football leagues for uh, nearly 15 years now and that's something i really really enjoy doing uh otherwise i mean sometimes video games maybe not as much as when i was uh, a teenager uh, and again that's something i don't really write about um so yeah, I, I I think yeah, if you're going to be a writer, I think it's really important to have hobbies. It's really important to have hobbies that you don't write about, um, because something has to just be for you. And so music and football are are the things I try and keep just for me, really. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Lily, for your question, and thank you, Juliet. Um, so that brings us to the end of this masterclass. Um, thank you so much, Judith, for being here today, and a uh, very big thank you to the ambassadors and, of course, to everyone watching this session. Um, if you'd like to know more about School Diversity Week or if you would like to view any of the other masterclasses, um, do follow us on social media. Uh, the handles are at Just Like Us UK on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook as well. Um, if you would like to know more about Judith's work and how we tell our stories as LGBT plus people, um, please visit Juliet's website, julietjakes.com. Um, and to view the other masterclasses, go to justlikeus.org um, forward slash masterclasses. Um, and of course, again, we want everyone to engage with this in a way that is as safe as possible. Um, so to make sure that you're up to date on how to keep yourself safe online, um, please take a look at justlikeus.org slash better online. Um, again, thank you so much uh, to Julia for being here today. Um, and goodbye for now to everyone tuning in. And I hope you all have a great day. So just a note on the terms that I'm using. I use the word transsexual to mean somebody who has changed their body with hormones and maybe surgery. And it's slightly different to trans, which I use to mean somebody who doesn't fit into the gender role that they were um, expected to and that they were assigned uh, when they were born so it's it's a kind of subset of of trans and I think it's really important when talking about this terminology to remember to always be sensitive to which terms people want to use for themselves and to respect them and to ask if, if necessary rather than just assuming <laughs>